Well, it's uh, great to be with you all. Uh, I know XY uh, Planning Network has um, a lot of very interesting planners who are focused on uh, doing the best by their clients. And uh, part of doing the best is try trying to use the most up-to-date um, and appropriate financial planning software. So what I'm gonna do today is, as Alex indicated, tell you just uh, uh, at a high level what the differences are between economics-based fi financial planning and conventional financial planning. I'm a professor of economics at Boston University. I've been working on uh, issues of financial planning, economics-based financial planning, really since uh, grad school when I started writing. Uh, I think one, one part of my thesis was a paper on the adequacy of savings. I've written about the adequacy of life insurance. And uh, to write these kinds of papers, you have to kind of figure out what people should be doing. Are they adequately saving? Well, you have to have a criteria for, you know how much they are saving based on surveys, but you have to have um, a uh, calculation of what they should be saving. So that led me to uh, develop uh, this company back in 1973. So we're 27 years old now, 19, sorry, 1993. And, uh, the uh, software is embedding uh, a number of the algorithms that I and uh, co-authors developed in, uh, as part of our research. So let me, uh, without spending any more time, uh, to start uh, right in and uh, tell you uh, the agenda for today's talk. First, I'm going to talk about uh, consumption smoothing, which is the core concept underlying economics-based planning, and uh, mention briefly the history of economics-based financial thought, and then uh, describe the difference between economics-based planning and conventional planning. And then I'm gonna illustrate uh, this consumption smoothing. I'm gonna illustrate economics-based planning using our Maxify software. That's um, our company's name is, uh, as Alex indicated, economic security planning. And our main software tool is uh, this Maxify planner, Maxify planner tool and uh, maxifyplanner.com. And then I'm going to uh, give you a case study uh, to try and make this um, a little more concrete. So uh, economics-based uh, planning is really a century old. It's uh, based on the uh, life cycle theory of consumption. And uh, it all started with the work of Irving Fisher. Uh, he was the top economist in 1920. If you go back to 1920, 1930, uh, he was the world's premier economist. Uh, had there been a Nobel Prize back then, he would have received it for sure. And then he became very infamous because basically a week before the crash of 29, he predicted that stock the stock prices were uh, at a permanently high plateau. They were not going to drop. And what happened is he had all his money in the stock market and he put invested all of Yale University's money in the stock market. He was a professor again at Yale. And uh, he proceeded to go bankrupt and Yale lost its shirt. So Yale had to actually literally uh, bail him out. He was uh, otherwise going to be homeless. <laughs> anyway, uh, he's uh, became infamous for his prediction. But among, among economists, he started this life cycle theory. All modern finance is based on the life cycle theory of um, consumption and saving. And uh, it has a key, key pr prediction, which is consumption smoothing. And the, the goal of consumption smoothing is very simple. It's a stable living standard. And it means to ha uh, what that means is having a stable living standard uh, over time. So between when you're young and old, you don't want to be eating cat food when you're young in order to uh, party when you're 90 and you might be dead when you're 90, nor do you want to uh, you know, be uh, consuming like crazy when you're 30 or 50 and then starving at 90. So you wanna have a smooth ride. That's what consumption uh, smoothing is all about. That's what economic, uh, the life cycle theory uh, recommends and predicts. And that's what common uh, everyday observation uh, suggests is actually happening. But Consumption smoothing is also about smoothing across, not just over time, but across times, good times and bad times. A good time is when you uh, uh, don't have 
an expensive operation that cost uh, $300,000. A bad time is when you do have that expensive operation. A good time is when your house doesn't burn down. A bad time is when it does burn down. A good time is when the stock market uh, booms. A bad time is when it crashes. So those are the times, good times and bad times. And economics says that you want to have a stable living standard across those good and bad times. That's consumption smoothing too. So where is all this consumption smoothing uh, coming from? Well, it's very simple. It's coming from the notion of the physiological uh, uh, sense of satiation that we all have. If, uh, if you did do what I did with my uh, younger son, David, who's uh, eight years younger than Alex, he's now 22. When he was uh, about 10 years old, I took him to the best bakery uh, where we lived. I bought about 15 cupcakes, chocolate cupcakes. They were his favorite. I brought him home. It was around two in the afternoon. His mom was not there. And I sat him down in front of the 20, these 15 cupcakes. And I said, have as many as you want, David. And the first one went down in about a half a second. The second one went down in about a second. The third one took about, I was timing, took about um, uh, three minutes. And in the middle of the third one, I said, David, have as many as you want. You know, we have all these cupcakes. Mom's not home. He said, let's save the rest for tomorrow. That's exactly what his, he said at every, what I guess I think it was age 10. And uh, this is uh, because he was getting filled up. So eating your first cupcake uh, at a given sitting uh, feels a whole lot better than eating your 20th cupcake because satiation sets in. And it sets in, uh, if you're consuming a whole lot in one year, it sets in as well. So that's why you wanna spread your consumption uh, through time, just like David wanted to spread his cupcakes across two days. <laughs> he wanted to eat all the rest um, the next day. He didn't have the concept in his mind of his entire lifetime. He just said that his time horizon was today and tomorrow. So uh, that's what consumption smoothing is. It's really based on physiology. It's based on, you know, medical, you know, realities or, or constitutions or medical co or physical constitutions. So economics is, is grounded in something, financial economics is grounding in something very real that we all experience personally. Now, uh, how do we capture this uh, mathematically in our theory? Well, we, we say that happiness in a given year, and this is the first line of this slide, is this uh, mathematical expression. And there's not gonna be any quiz or test after uh, this uh, webinar, so don't worry about this if it's not 100% clear, but it's saying that your happiness, your utility, which is this symbol U at time T, how happy you are depends on how much you get to consume, that's the C. But then there's this um, funny symbol, it's called a Greek gamma, and it uh, really captures your satiation. So the bigger is that gamma, uh, the less and less uh, happiness, extra happiness you get from more and more cupcakes. That's basically the story. Now, that's your happiness at a point in time, your happiness over your entire lifetime is the sum of all these annual happiness terms. That's your lifetime happiness. And uh, your goal in a, uh, your economics goal is to make your lifetime happiness as high as possible. And you do that by not making your C at a given year, like your consumption in 2020, super high and your consumption in all the future years, super low. That's not going to make uh, the sum of all these UT functions, these UT uh, mathematical expressions, the sum of them as big as possible. Rather, uh, spreading uh, the CTs out, making the CTs pretty much the same number every year, uh, that's going to make your lifetime happiness as large as possible. Now, this gamma term is actually called the coefficient of risk aversion. And you may have heard of that risk aversion concept in talking to, to clients about their uh, investment strategies. And uh, the risk aversion is really controlling the degree of satiation because it has to do with, uh, look, if you were to consume like crazy in good times when the stocks are high uh, and you weren't getting very satiated, if you weren't very risk averse, uh, that might be okay. But if you are getting very satiated, then you're gonna be very concerned about the bad times about 
uh, starving when the stock market crashes. So the gamma here is called the risk aversion coefficient, but you can also call it the satiation coefficient if you like. It's the same thing. And uh, this is telling you right away that the theory of saving, how we allocate our resources between consuming when we're young, when we're middle aged, when we're old, is completely connected to the question of how we allocate our portfolios, whether we diversify our assets, whether we put all our eggs in one basket. It's also connected to the theory of, of insurance, whether we take a risk uh, and to be, uh, you know, to be starving if our house burns down because we haven't bought life insurance, uh, sorry, homeowners insurance, or whether we buy homeowners insurance and uh, consume less in the worlds, in the states of the world in which our house doesn't burn down because we have to pay the premium, but we get to consume more when our house does burn, burn down. That's smoothing our living standard across those different situations, those different states of nature, as economists call it. That's consumption smoothing. So, so we'll see that uh, we're sa what I'm saying is that this theory of consumption smoothing is um, uh, a unified theory of saving, spending, uh, but it's also a theory of uh, portfolio diversification, and it's a theory of insurance. It's all one theory based on this little equation right there, that simple. And uh, the other thing that economics uh, says, the economics brings to the table, is that you can't spend more over your lifetime or in any, you know, even in different states of the world than you can really afford. So there's a lifetime budget that you have to uh, obey, that you can't end up dying uh, with a negative net worth, for example. Uh, you can't end up dying broke. The uh, and your economic resources, uh, ignoring any uncertainty right now, because I'm going to talk more about that in the third lecture, is uh, the sum of your in present value. You've got your assets, which is already a present value, how much wealth you have right now. Then you've got your, your future labor income, and that uh, can be valued in the present. And then you're also going to have future benefits like Social Security benefits. Uh, but then you're also going to have to pay taxes, federal income taxes and FICA taxes and um, state income taxes. So that's like a negative resource. So the sum of all these things, less the taxes, is your lifetime resources. And your consumption, your spending in present value has to equal the present value of these resources. That's the fundamental lifetime budget constraint that we all live under. But it's not very relevant, and that's not, it's not very uh, apparent in conventional financial planning and uh, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along here. Now, another constraint that that uh, arises when you're trying to smooth your living standard is this cash flow constraint, uh, that households can't borrow beyond a fixed amount, and that might be zero. So if you're, let's say, a 28-year-old uh, a, a uh, medical student, and you're uh, going to be a top, heart surgeon and you know you're going to be making $500,000 a year when you finish your residency at age uh, maybe 38, you can't borrow against that uh, future income. And you might have a, a spouse and a kids uh, to, uh, to feed and you may have a mortgage to pay off even at your young age and even some student loans to pay off. So your living standard has to be lower because you're cash constrained. So any good financial planning software has to deal with these cash constraints. So it wants to smooth your living standard, if we're talking about economics-based software, subject to not putting you into debt. And that's what uh, Maxim Maxify does. And uh, uh, the um, simplest version of uh, uh, the mathematics of uh, consumption smoothing has you just basically uh, having the same living standard per household member every year, but not ever going into debt. So trying to get the smoothest living standard subject to not going into debt. So let me just uh, proceed here. The I said that uh, this theory unifies the theory of uh, saving insurance and diversification. We've uh, all heard a, a little bit probably about the physicists trying to find a unified theory of gravity and um, 
and relativity and quantum mechanics and uh, quantum theory. Well, economics has unified theory. We haven't, we're not still trying to find a unified theory. We have it, it's been in, a, in existence for now 100 years. I mean, it was first developed by Fisher, but then many economists added to it. And it really, uh, just to be clear, just to repeat, uh, you know, if you ask yourself the question, why do people save? Well, they don't want to starve when they're old. Uh, it's better to give up some consumption when young to smooth your living standard, have less consumption when young to have more consumption when old. Why buy insurance? Well, you don't want to uh, be starving when you're uh, when you total your car uh, versus uh, when you don't total your car. Why diversify your investment? Again, when you lose your shirt in the market, you don't want to have a dramatically lower lifetime utility at that point. It's better to hold less stock and consume less when stocks boom than to take the risk of um, of losing all your money when stocks uh, crash. Uh, by the way, we have some thunder crashing outside, so if you hear some noise in the background, it's because we're in, in the middle of a, a summer uh, storm here, where I'm at in, uh, uh, right now. So uh, let me just give you a, a real brief uh, history of intellectual thought in economics. You may have heard of Franco Medigliani. He won the Nobel Prize for extending Fisher's life cycle model to explain national saving and growth. Uh, we had Bill Sharp, Harry Markowitz, Jim Tobin. They all use the life cycle model to develop um, or extend the capital asset pricing model. Each of them won the Nobel Prize in economics. Menachem Yari used the life cycle model to explain and integrate life uh, the life insurance, the theory of life insurance and theory of annuity insurance. And he should definitely win the Nobel Prize. He, he did a brilliant work in 1965. He showed that uh, an annuity insurance contract is really mathematically the opposite. A neg it's really a negative life insurance contract and a uh, life insurance contract is a negative annuity insurance contract. So he did the seminal work on that. Bob Merton, who you've probably heard about, who uh, won the Nobel Prize primarily for his work on, on app option pricing, along with Fisher Black and Myron Scholes. He uh, wrote an entire book called Continuous Time Finance, which is uh, his probably most important work uh, in his lifetime. It's chock full of the life cycle model. It's fi fundamentally based on the life cycle model of lifetime utility maximization. Many other economists, including Milton Friedman, received the, the Nobel Prize for work uh, in whole or in part based on the life cycle model. We've got people like Robert Schiller, who um, won the Nobel Prize for criticizing the life cycle model. Richard Thaler, Thaler, Thaler uh, did a, um, a lot of work on behavioral finance, and he was also criticizing some of the predictions of the life cycle model, but it's all going back to the life cycle theory one way or the other. Now, what's the difference between uh, conventional personal finance and uh, economic-based uh, personal finance? Well, conventional personal finance involves the opposite of consumption smoothing. It really involves consumption disruption. Now, let me be uh, clear about what's going on there. Conventional planning asks clients to set their post-retirement spending goal and to save uh, up to meet it or to invest in a way to try and meet it. But let's just talk about uh, the case of somebody who wants to spend in a invest in a cautious conservative manner well in order to meet that spending goal they're going to have to save the appropriate amount given the return that they expect to get now if the retirement spending goal is set too low the client's going to be told hey you don't need to save so much and naturally the client will spend what they don't have to save and then the client will spend too much pre-retirement and at retirement age, they're gonna experience a drop in their consumption. If the spending goal is set too high, the client is gonna to spend too little pre-retirement and experience a jump in consumption at, at retirement. Either way, this is consumption disruption, it's not consumption smoothing. Conventional planning is therefore giving the wrong saving and spending recommendations because right off the bat, it's asking the client to figure out something that's extremely complicated, 
which is if the client really wants to have a smooth living standard, then you're asking the client, uh, one is asking the client to, to try and solve the problem for themselves, figure out how much they should spend in retirement and in effect, how much to spend before retirement. But we're trying to get these two amounts to be equal. And then we have to take into account lots of factors in order to figure out how do you get those two living standards before and after retirement to be the same thing and take into account uh, the composition of the, of the household. You really care about the living standard per household member. So that's uh, all part of economics-based planning, but it's not part of conventional planning. So if you ask me, if somebody walked, uh, if, I, if I walked into a, um, a financial planner's office or I hopped on to eMoney or Money Guide Pro or NavaPlan or any of the other programs that um, are used uh, to do conventional planning. And the first question that was asked to, of me is what's my target? What's my retirement goal? My answer would be $20 trillion a year. I'd like to spend $20 trillion a year. And you can see right away that that's ridiculous. Nobody has that kind of money. And it's obviously violating the lifetime budget constraint but there's nothing that constrains me from giving that answer. So in the end, I would have to adjust down my spending. The planner I was dealing with or the software wouldn't accept it. And I'd say, put in something more realistic. Well, in the end, I'm trying to get something that is gonna give me the same living standard after as before retirement. And uh, that's a very, very complicated problem that can't be solved by a human brain by themselves. It has to be solved by very sophisticated software. Now, the other thing to say about conventional uh, personal finance is it really has no basis in life cycle theory. Uh, if you guess the wrong target, you're gonna not just uh, be told to save the wrong amount and spend the wrong amount, but you're gonna be given the wrong life insurance recommendations because how much life insurance uh, you need is really to ensure the living standard of your survivors. But if you guess the wrong living standard, you're gonna ensure the wrong amount. Uh, the conventional portfolio analysis simulates the probability of you not being able to make your plan's goals, meet your goals, which um, uh, this, this conventional uh, portfolio analysis of uh, setting a goal, uh, simulating whether if you save the amount you're now saving, spend the amount you have set for post-retirement spending and never deviate by one iota, no matter what happens to the market, if the market crashes or goes through the roof, you never change your spending after retirement. Uh, and then you see whether or not you run out of money at the end of your days. That's simulating three fundamental economic mistakes. Uh, you're spending the wrong amount when you're young in this methodology, you're spending the wrong amount when you're old in this methodology, and you're never adjusting come hell or high water. So that's the simulation of three fundamental uh, economic mistakes, but that's what conventional portfolio advice or analysis is all about, simulating whether you're gonna fail having made three huge mistakes that most people are not gonna make or gonna try and avoid making. So. The other thing to say about conventional planning, and I'm being, being perfectly uh, frank here, and I hope I'm not you know, insulting anybody uh, or conventional planning in general. Uh, I'm not, that's not my goal. I'm an economist. I'm just trying to say things the way I see them and as the way, uh, you know, the way economics uh, uh, sees things. That the other big problem with conventional financial planning is that there's no guarantee that it's satisfying the lifetime budget constraint. And you see that in simulating whether or not the plan is gonna work. If it fails, it hasn't satisfied the lifetime budget constraint. If it, it succeeds, it's gonna leave money on the table because you say, well, you've, you haven't run out of money, but you haven't spent the money either. So it's not a plan for, uh, for spending all your resources if you live to your maximum age of life, which is the age at which, um, uh, to which a uh, Maxify planner plans. So let us now uh, move to uh, 
uh, understanding the complexity of getting this right. I think that conventional planning has been developed over the years because planners had to tell their clients something. They tried their best. The software industry, the conventional planning software industry said, this is a very, very complicated problem to do it correctly. We have no idea if you go back to the 1950s and 60s and 70s even, and 80s and 90s, how to solve this problem. I was an economist, I got a PhD from Harvard in 1977. There was not a single economist in the world that could solve this problem back then. So conventional planning developed uh, its methodology in a vacuum that economists created. We had a really good theory, but we had no way to implement it. We had no computer technology, let alone the right computer algorithms, the right software, to try and get the give an answer. So we just said, sat back and said, well, you guys are doing it wrong. But we had no way of saying, hey, here's the right way to do it. Or this is an improvement. So the fact that it's that conventional planning developed the way it did is because it was the best that could be done at the time. But uh, I'm arguing that something better can be done right now um, and uh, something that adheres to economic theory. Now, all these uh, elements uh, that you see on this chart, income, assets, taxes, saving, insurance, spending, they all interact with each other in figuring out how you can have a smooth living standard. Uh, you have to, uh, to uh, know what your taxes are in order to figure out what you can spend, but you need to understand what you can, in order to spend, figure out what you can spend, you have to know what your taxes are gonna be uh, or how much life insurance you're gonna be paying in premiums, how much premiums you're gonna pay. That affects how much you can spend, but how much you spend affects how much life insurance you need to protect your survivors to have the same living standard. So we have all these complicated interactions that have to be solved for. Uh, it's like you know multiple chicken and egg problems, and we have to solve for this very precisely to get the taxes exactly right, the Social Security benefits right, the Medicare Part B premiums right, to deal with things like minimum distribution requirements, Roth conversions, prepayment of mortgages. All that stuff has to be done very, very carefully. And take into account all the interactions. Uh, if I prepay my mortgage, it could affect my asset balances and therefore my taxes. You know, uh, Roth conversion clearly has tax implications. So all that has to be handled. Now, this slide, which I'm not going to go through all the details, is just uh, re reiterating uh, some of what I just said. It, it's it's basically basically saying that we had to develop algorithms. Uh, as these, uh, as the as the uh, computer so hardware came along, that could run really quickly and do things uh, in terms of parallel processing, do things uh, at the same time, do different, you know, pretty much the same task at the same time. Uh, we had to develop uh, technology here, which involved uh, uh, also dealing with cash constraints, cash flow constraints. And that requires a methodology called dynamic programming, which was developed in the 50s by, uh, uh, by a mathematician. And, uh, but we had to come up with a very special way of doing dynamic programming. And we had to do it very, very fast and very, very accurately uh, to deal with all the complexity. So uh, let, me, let me now give you a, an example of uh, this consumption smoothing using uh, this Maxify software. I wanna first point out that the living standard that we're focused on in trying to smooth in Maxify Planner is discretionary spending per household member. Discretionary spending is everything apart from your fixed expenses. Your fixed expenses are your taxes, your housing expenses, your alimony payments, any tuition payments for your kids. Those are off the top expenses you can't really smooth out those expenses. You have to just pay those. Uh, but the um, uh, but your discretionary spending, you can smooth. And uh, you also have to, uh, in this analysis, take into account the fact that there's economies in shared living. Two can live more cheaply than one. So the software handles that. And 
children may also be less expensive than kids. The software has an, a default assumption that kids are 70% as expensive as adults. So the goal of the software is to have a smooth living standard per household member through time, subject to uh, not uh, putting that household into debt or putting that household further into debt, unless they expressly say they want to go into debt or are able to go into debt. So here's the uh, case study, and, and then I'm going to show you the software. It's a couple, Janet, who is age 53, and Jeffrey, 57. Their kids are out of the household. Janet's earning 250000 a year. She's going to retire and take Social Security at 67. Jeff's uh, earning 50000 He's going to retire and take Social Security at 62. They live in D.C. in a million-dollar house. They've got no mortgage. Uh, Janet's got a $2 million 401k retirement account. Jeff has a $300,000 IRA. The couple has $100,000 in regular assets. And there's other details like their social security earnings histories, how much uh, they have to pay in property taxes and, and homeowners insurance uh, and maintenance. I've left those things out, but you can kind of guess at the reasonable numbers they are. So let me now show you the software program. And I've set up this case of uh, Janet and Jeffrey, and I'm just going to click on their base profile. And all the information I've told you about, I've entered. Uh, if I wanted to set up a new client just to show you how easy it is, I would uh, click Get Started. I'd enter, enter let's say, Jim uh, Smith. And just to sh show you how this works, are you married? Uh, what's your marital status? Partner? Do you have any kids? No. It works just like TurboTax in terms of a wizard walking you through the program. So let's go back to, um, oh, I think I closed out the program. That wasn't so smart. <laughs> the, um, let, me, let me go back and log back in to um, the tool. Okay. Uh, just do that. Okay, log in. Okay, so this is the case of uh, Janet and Jeff I've set up. And having walked through that wizard, I've set up Janet, for example, to have earnings of 250000 if I click on Janet's name, I see that she's going to retire at, uh, well, actually, I specified uh, uh, 67 in a, let's see what I do in her earnings record. Uh, yeah, actually, I guess I've got her retiring at 65. I, I got that wrong. Uh, she's making 250, and she has Social Security earnings history, which I've entered, and uh, she has these... Uh, $2 million in retirement accounts. I could change those. Anyway, Jeff, we've told told you about $50,000 a year he's, he's making. He's going to retire at 62, take Social Security 62. I've specified their Social Security strategy here. They have regular assets of um, $100,000. They've got this house for a million. And uh, if I wanted to change some inputs uh, about you know, whether taxes are going to increase or Social Security benefits are going to be cut or when they're going to take Medicare, or whether they want to have actually a smooth living standard or have it uh, change through time, decline. I could set this index to, to indicate the pattern of their living standard. And here's where I specify uh, safe rates of return. And I'm assuming, based on the current market, that they can earn 1.5% on long-term treasuries, but that the inflation rate implied by the TIPS long-term treasury rate is 1.5%. So this is really a zero real return environment that we're in. But let, let me now uh, run their base case, and I want to uh, illustrate the consumption smoothing and the adherence to the lifetime budget constraint that uh, economics-based planning uh, does. Now, you saw that that run in, ran in about uh, half a second. When we first started working on this program back in uh, 1970, 1993, I didn't think this would ever work in even, you know, 2,000 years, but we got that to work in a half a second, and that took lots of effort. So it's been 27 years in the making, and uh, 
here you see that the lifetime budget constraint is being satisfied within two dollars and the program is uh, showing you that look uh, here's the resources 3.5 million in earnings 2.2 million in uh, social security benefits and present value retirement account which is 2.5 regular assets all these things are valued at the end of the uh, of the first year in those dollars and uh, there's a total of 8.3 million but they're also going to spend 8.3 million in the form of housing expenses uh, taxes of almost 2 million retirement account contributions that they still have to make and uh, Medicare premiums pretty big but 4.9 million they get to do in discretionary spending and then we have a, a wizard that takes you through the outputs uh, to show your client, you can do it kind of step by step, and there's text to explain, which you can either turn on or turn off. But here's the key thing. This uh, green curve is uh, the household's income. You can see it's uh, high for a while, but then it drops off when um, uh, uh, there's retirement, and that's uh, one of the reasons it drops. Well, you know, first of all, uh, Jeff draw, retires, and then um, uh, and then we have um, uh, retirement of um, of Janet, and we have social security. We have uh, withdrawals of uh, retirement accounts kicking in at 65 as well. So there's a variety of things going on here, and the income path is very uneven. And that's you know social security is also kicking in for the couple. Uh, first it's 62 for Jeff and then 67 for Janet. And then we have this blue curve, which is their fixed expenses, which is in large part taxes, which are high before they retire and then low later. But you can see that the program has uh, produced a smooth living standard because this is the discretionary spending. It drops when uh, Jeff dies. He's uh, When he reaches 100, that's his maximum age of life if he does reach 100. Then uh, Janet will have the same living standard, but she doesn't need as much discretionary spending because of um, the fact that there's only one mouth to feed here, not two. So this drop in discretionary spending is taking into account the economies and shared living. So it's not like a 50% drop, but it's still a drop. So you can see that that's a case of a perfectly smooth living standard. You can see that we've got lifetime budget balance. You can also follow their assets through time and you can see that they die broke exactly at 100 there's no money being left on the table uh, the uh, discretionary spending the living standard per person is perfectly smooth right here the discretionary spending is the blue but the orange here is the is the living standard per person even after he's dead there's enough money for janet to have exactly the same living standard so there's all kinds of reports here that uh, one can look at either in chart form or in table form. But anyway, uh, the next thing I want to do is illustrate, and I'm just going to spend like another five minutes and then we'll start with some questions. I want to show you conventional planning. What if the uh, couple plans to spend 20% uh, too much relative to what uh, this software program is saying they should spend in retirement? So they set their... Um, spending to be 20 percent too high and the way i actually do that is um i go to settings and assumptions here and i uh sorry they they set their spending to be 20 percent too low so i i have them uh, uh i specify that after she retires janet retires that um their living standard index drops 20 uh, percent now they might want to have that happen which is why we let them do that in this uh uh, in this part of the program, but let's suppose that uh, they really didn't want their living standard to drop, but they set the target too low. Well, then we can figure out from our software how much they're going to be spending before retirement. And now I'm going to just show you that. And uh, I'm just going to run that report, compare it with a base case report. And And here's the th key thing I want you to look at. Uh, the orange uh, curve here on the right shows you their discretionary spending uh, based on having set a target that's too low. And then the blue curve is the discretionary spending 
if they're doing this consumption smoothing, uh, getting the target, letting the, not guessing at the target, but getting it right uh, in our software. Well, what you see here is that their living standard drops about 25%. Their spending goes from $124,000 a year down to $99,000 a year. Uh, that's the problem with cons with guessing at how much you want to be spending in retirement. This uh, is far too complicated. It's it's easy to make a 10%, 20%, 30% mistake in how much you should be spending in retirement. It's just uh, far too complicated. Too many factors going on to get this straight. I mean, are you going to be able to know what kind of uh, income taxes and Medicare Part P premiums uh, you're going to have to pay uh, when you're 82? Uh, and <laughs> It's just far too complicated. Are you going to be in the high income Medicare premium bracket or not? Uh, well, that, that you can't figure that out on your own. You can't guess that. So anyway, that's one thing I wanted to show you, which is consumption disruption. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, what happens if um, if Janet were to make not 250000 but let's have, have her just earn $100,000 a year. And let's have them decide that they want to take their re retirement account money at 72 when the uh, minimum distribution requirements, or the required minimum distribution, I forget whether it's, yeah, <laughs> which way it's say, it said, uh, when, when they kick in, well, let me now uh, run this case. And uh, what you'll see is the uh, fact that they're quite liquid, the borrowing constraint, because She's not making that much money at this point in this case. And consequently, they can't have as high a living standard. Uh, if he's retiring at 62, she's going to retire at 65. And you can see from the orange curve that their discretionary spending is uh, uh, below what would be in the base plan, uh, the uh, which is the case where they're taking their retirement account money out at 65. Uh, here, uh, she's taking out her, uh, and also she's making more money in the base plan because I haven't changed that to be 100,000. But you can see a case where basically I have a smooth living standard. They do have a smooth living standard versus one in which the living standard uh, discretionary spending is way down here and then it jumps up dramatically because they are cash constrained. And uh, the program is really good at uh, figuring out cash constraints. And then it allows the planner to sit with a client and say, well, look, here's some different ways to alleviate the cash constraints. Let's take your retirement account money before age 72 so you're not so pinched. Let's have you keep working. Uh, uh, Jeff, you want to stop working at 62. How about if you stop working at 65? How about that? Let's see what that does. Maybe we can reduce this borrowing constraint, this cash constraint problem. So the last thing I want to show you is I want to go back to the base plan. But I just want to show you that our program does some robo optimization over Social Security and retirement account withdrawal dates. The program now is going to try and figure out what's the optimal age to take Social Security and uh, what's the optimal age is to take retirement account withdrawals. Okay, so. So imagine you had uh, Janet and Jeff in your office and they said they wanted to uh, do what they're doing, take Social Security as soon as they retired and take their retirement account withdrawals at 65, both of them. And you said, well, just wait a second. Let me see if I can do something that's perfectly safe and uh, see if I can raise your lifetime spending. Well, uh, this just by clicking on that button, you're able to raise their lifetime spending by almost a half a million dollars. And that's because under this maximized plan, they're both going to take the their Social Security benefits at 70, not at uh, 62 and uh, 65 uh, when they retire. And they're also going to uh, uh, be taking their uh, retirement account money a little bit differently from uh, what they had set, specified. So here you can see that the annual discretionary spending is up by about $10,000 a year. 
So about $8,000 a month. That's, I'm sorry, $800 a month. That's uh, a good thing. And their maximized plan involves them both taking their Social Security at 70. So the, the, the program can very often surprise you and uh, teach you things that you hadn't expected. Let me stop here and move us to uh, some Q&A.